Hi guys! In this video we're going to be looking at stress strain graphs, properties of stress strain graphs, Young's modulus and we're going to finish with a summary. So first of all we're going to look at stress strain graphs and how we plot them. We can use a force extension graph to investigate the behaviour of an object made of a certain material. So for example we can investigate the behaviour of a spring. So when we apply a mass to this spring, um, it experiences a tensile force, F. And because of this tensile force, the spring extends. So it's now got an extension. So we've seen that if we measure the extension of the spring for various forces, we can plot a graph of force against extension and we get this straight line. We get a linear relationship between the two because the spring is obeying Hooke's law. This force extension graph is specific to an object made of a certain material and not the type of material in general. So we've said we put force on the y-axis and extension on the x-axis. However, this graph produced is specific to this particular object of the material. So in this case, this graph is um, unique to this spring made out of a particular material. But we could have a different spring with other dimensions and we wouldn't get the same graph even though it was made out of the same material. Or we might have a wire as opposed to a spring. And again, this could all be the same material, but because we've got different objects, we actually get a different force extension graph. So since we get different force extension graphs for different objects of this particular material, we cannot use the same graph to predict the behaviour of another object of the same material because they all produce different graphs. So this graph that we produced for the previous spring can't actually be used to predict the behaviour of this other spring. So even though it's made out of the same material, it's got different dimensions. The tensile stress and strain of a material are used to describe the behaviour of a material independent of its original dimensions. So we know that the stress a material experiences is equal to the force applied to it per unit area. So because we're dividing the force per unit area, so we find the force, for example, per metre squared, this means we're not taking the material's dimensions into account. So we, end, so we can calculate, therefore, the stress in the spring when we apply a certain force to it and when the spring has a particular cross-sectional area, A. And this is also the case with the strain. So the strain is independent of the original dimensions of the material. So we've seen that strain is the ratio of the extension x divided by the natural length l of the material. And we can also write the extension as delta l, as in the small change in l that we get, divided by l again. So if the spring was originally this length, we can see that it's now got an extension x, or delta l. And therefore the natural length of the spring is this because that was its length before the force was applied. So these properties are independent of the material's original dimensions which means they're much more useful to us than force and extension. So using these properties we can produce a stress strain graph of a material to investigate its behaviour under a tensile force. So when we produce a stress strain graph, we put stress on the y-axis, so the stress is in pascals or newtons per metre squared, and then we put the strain on the x-axis, and remember strain doesn't have any units. So this is a stress strain graph. And what's so useful about a stress strain graph is that the stress strain graph is the same for all objects of the same material, regardless of their different dimensions. So for example, we've got three completely different springs here, but they're all made of the same material. So even though they've all got different dimensions, so for example, this spring might have natural length L like so, this one has a different natural length, and this spring has a different natural length, and then they've all got different cross-sectional areas, we can see that, that cross-sectional area is different from this one, and that's different from this one, and they therefore all have different extensions as well, 
So despite the fact that they all have different dimensions, when we apply a force F to each of these springs, so we apply the mass to apply a tensile force, and if we were to plot a stress strain graph for all three of these springs, we actually get the exact same graph because they're all made of the same materials. So this is why they're so useful. So despite the fact that we have different dimensions, we still get the same stress strain graph. So now that we understand why a stress strain graph is so useful and we know how to plot one, we can look at the properties of a stress strain graph. We can produce a stress strain graph of a metal wire by observing its behaviour under a tensile stress. So we said a stress strain graph puts stress on the y-axis in pascals and strain on the x-axis. So the strain is to do with the extension of the material and we know the stress is the force per unit area that the material experiences. And then we're able to produce a stress strain graph like this one. And this stress strain graph actually tells us certain properties about the material. So we can use the properties of the stress strain graph of a metal wire to explain some important mechanical properties of materials. So there are actually certain important points on this stress strain graph. So one of which is here, another one is this point here, these points here, and then the last two points that tell us properties about the material are these two points. So these points here on the graph allow us to obtain certain important information about a particular material. So we can work out how the material behaves. We have come across the limit of proportionality on a force extension graph, up to which the material obeys Hooke's law. So when we put force on the y-axis and extension on the x-axis in a force extension graph, we've seen that the point at which the material no longer obeys Hooke's law is when the graph is no longer linear. So that's this point here. And we call this point the limit of proportionality. And that's because the force and the extension are no longer directly proportional after this point. And we've said that within this region, when we have a linear graph, the material obeys Hooke's law. So similarly, we can identify the limit of proportionality on a stress strain graph. It's the point after which the graph is no longer linear. So we identify the limit of proportionality on a stress strain graph the same way we identify it on a force extension graph. So we can see that after this point here, the graph is no longer linear. So up until then, we've got a linear graph. And after that, it's no longer linear. So we can see that it curves and it changes shape. So this is our limit of proportionality, which for short, we're going to label it L. The elastic limit can also be found on the stress strain graph. So the elastic limit is this point here. And it's the point until which the material still behaves elastically. So up until the elastic limit, and we're calling, we're going to label the elastic limit E, the material is going to behave elastically. And what this means is that it's going to return to its original shape after the load has been removed. So a material will return to its original form after the load is removed before it reaches its elastic limit. So for example, if the original length of the spring was this point here, and it now experiences an extension X because we've applied this load, if we then remove this load, so there's no longer a load on the spring anymore, if the spring is still behaving elastically, it's going to return to its original length. So it's going to have zero extension. So when the spring returns to its original form, we say it displays elastic behavior. So this is up until the elastic limit. After the elastic limit, the wire behaves plastically. So the material is permanently deformed. So now let's imagine we've applied a different load and this was the original length of the spring. So it's got an extension X due to this load F. But now we're going to imagine that we remove the load F, but the spring hasn't returned to its original length. So it's still got an extension. So we can see now that it's no longer behaving elastically and it's actually been permanently deformed.
So this occurs beyond the elastic limit, and that's in the plastic region. There are also upper and lower yield points, where the material extends suddenly and its tensile stress is reduced. So our upper yield point is this point here on the graph, we're going to call this Y1, and then this is our lower yield point, Y2. So upper yield point is the peak of this little hump, and then Y2 is this dip, so that's our lower yield point. So we can see that between Y1 and Y2, the tensile stress is reduced. So the tensile stress is reduced between Y1 and Y2, but the strain still increases. The maximum stress that a material can withstand before it breaks is labelled as the ultimate tensile stress, UTS. So this is easy to identify because, because it's going to be the point in our graph where we have the greatest stress. So we can see that that's going to be the top of this curve here. So that's our maximum tensile stress, which is called our UTS. So it's the ultimate tensile stress and it's the maximum stress we get on this graph. Beyond this point, the material loses its strength and becomes longer and narrower at its weakest points. This is known as necking. So after this UTS, after the ultimate tensile stress, we can see that this spring has become thinner and narrower. And this process is known as necking. The material eventually breaks at its breaking point. So the point at which the material breaks, so it splits into two, is the breaking point. And we can also label this point on our graph. So the stress at which a material breaks is called the breaking stress or fracture stress. And that's the very end of our graph here because beyond this point the material's broken so it no longer experiences a stress or strain. So we're going to call this point B and that is the breaking stress or fracture stress. So now that we understand the properties of a stress-strain graph, this leads us on to the property of a material which is called its Young's modulus. We have identified that a stress-strain graph is linear before we reach the limit of proportionality. So we've said with our stress-strain graph we put stress on the y-axis and strain on the x-axis. So we can see the graph is linear up until the limit of proportionality which is this point here. So before the limit of proportionality, we still have a linear graph. This is shown by a constant gradient, which we can find by dividing the tensile stress by tensile strain before the limit of proportionality. So again, we've got our stress on our y-axis and strain on the x-axis, and we've said we have linear behavior up until this limit of proportionality, which we're calling L. So because we've got a linear graph and we've got a straight line, we can actually work out the gradient of this line. And we work out the gradient of this line by doing the change in sigma, because that's on the y-axis, divided by the change in the strain, because that's the change in the x-axis. So we remember that gradient is the change in y over the change in x. So in this case, we calculate the gradient by doing the change in sigma divided by the change in the strain. So this constant gradient that we get in the linear region can actually be defined. So we define this constant as the Young's modulus. So the Young's modulus of a material E, that's the symbol it's given, is equal to stress sigma divided by strain, because that's what we've had to do to calculate the gradient of this graph. So that's what E stands for, the Young's modulus. And then we said stress is sigma and the epsilon symbol here is strain. And we can also work out the units of Young's modulus by considering the units of stress and strain. So we've said Young's modulus is equal to stress divided by strain. And we've said that stress has units newtons per meter squared, or pascals. And we've said that strain doesn't have any units because it's a ratio. So this tells us we've got newtons per meter squared divided by no units. So the unit of Young's modulus is also going to be newtons per meter squared, or pascals. So it's got the same units as stress.
The Young's modulus is a measure of the stiffness of a material and is different for different materials. So we've got a number of different materials here. We've got polystyrene, we've got lead, and we've got diamond. So the Young's modulus of a material is unique to that particular material. So polystyrene has a Young's modulus of 3 times 10 to the 9 pascals. Lead has a Young's modulus of 1.8 times 10 to the 10 pascals. And diamond has a Young's modulus of 1.2 times 10 to the 12 pascals. So because they've all, all got different Young's moduli and we get the Young's modulus from a stress strain graph, that means they've all got different stress strain graphs as well. So that's what we've got here. We've got the stress strain graphs of each of these materials. So we've got stress on the y-axis in pascals and then strain on the x-axis. So we can see that the greater the Young's modulus we have, so for example, diamond's got the greatest Young's modulus out of the three because it's the stiffest, it's got the greatest gradient because we get the Young's modulus from the gradient of the stress strain graph in its linear region. And then the polystyrene material has the smallest Young's modulus because it's the least stiff and it then also has the smallest gradient. So let's look at an example. Find the Young's modulus of a wire under a tensile stress of 3.8 times 10 to the 4 pascals and strain of 2.5. So our first step is to write down the formula for Young's modulus. So Young's modulus E is given by stress divided by strain. And now our second step is to just substitute in the values to find the Young's modulus. So we find the Young's modulus E by substituting in our value for stress, which we were told was 3.8 times 10 to the 4. And we're then going to divide by the strain under which the material is under, which is 2.5. So this gives us a Young's modulus E that is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the 4 pascals to two significant figures. So that is our Young's modulus to two significant figures. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.